Hello, and welcome to the 1840 Podcast, where each month we explore a different topic balancing modern sensibilities with traditional sensitivities to give you new approaches to timeless Jewish ideas. I'm your host, David Beshevkin, and this month we're exploring the origins of Judaism. This podcast is part of a larger exploration of those big, juicy Jewish ideas, so be sure to check out 1840.org, where you can also find videos, articles, and recommended readings. I have a hesitance about this week's episode, but not for any reason that I have ever shared or had for any other episode. Normally, I am somewhat concerned because it's a topic that, you know, might get me in trouble. It might be, I don't know, heretical. It might be a topic that I don't feel comfortable with. I don't know so much about. Today's episode, which is about Rav Sazuk and Rav Cook's approach to the development of of Judaism itself to the development of Yiddishkeit gives me pause because the writings of Reb Tzadok in particular and through Reb Tzadok also Reb Cook are something that is so intimate to me, is something that's such a part of me that I am worried that I'm not going to be able to do it justice. I'm worried that I'm not going to be able to adequately explain, at least in my mind, why I think Reb Tzadok's approach is so foundational. But thank God we have an amazing guest this week who is really an expert, not just in the academic background, not just in the actual lived experience of Torah Shabal Peh, somebody who is immersed in the base medrash, and also somebody who spent a great deal of time explicating the writings of Rav Cook. So I'm not all too worried about that, but I do want to give some context to Rav Tzadok in particular, who will be contrasting in some ways to Rav Cook. They run on parallel tracks in a lot of ways. Just a little bit of background, there's so much to talk about, and I think particularly for this series, I would just want to remind our listeners to check out 1840.org, that's 18-F-O-R-T-Y.org. Normally I say where you can also find videos, articles, recommended readings, etc., etc., we are running specific series, written series, throughout this month that are focusing on this topic. There's an incredible series by Yosef Lindell, I think a five-part series on the development of the oral law that has a lot more sources, gets involved in a lot of the nitty-gritty and the development and the key ideas that are involved in this and proceeds much more sequentially. So if you want to reach out and see more, definitely consult our website, 1840.org. And also you can check out, we have a great primer on the key articles about Rip Tzadok's approach to Torah Shabbat Pet in particular that you can check out that's on our website. If you haven't signed up for our emails, we'll be emailing it out, or you, of course you can check it out. I think it'll be a thread on social media. But make sure that if this is a topic that interests you, there's so much to talk about and it's so easy to have misunderstanding, to have an incomplete understanding. So don't stop with the interviews. Really delve into it deeper. And we have so many resources online to support that. But in this intro, I want to focus specifically on Rip Tzadok HaKohen Melublin. I've mentioned his name many, many times, and for listeners who are new, just a little bit of background. He was born in 1823, and he died in 1900. He's somebody who animates so much of my thought. He began his life not in the Hasidic world. He really began as an absolute genius immersed in classic rabbinic thought. I know everyone is called a genius. Every famous rabbi is called a genius, but we don't have to just speculate about his genius. We have his bar mitzvah drusha. We have actual documents that he wrote as a teenager that attest to kind of where he was in his own development. And it really is jaw-dropping what he accomplished at such a young age. At the heart of all of Rip Tzadok's work, which is so interesting, he's coming around the same time in the mid-19th century when there were so many questions about the authenticity, about the authority, about what the project of the oral law actually was. And many people respond directly somewhat polemically to people who dismissed the notion of the oral law. I think chief among them is Rav Shamshin Rafal Hirsch, who wrote some excellent works on this topic. But Rav Tzadok takes a different approach. Rav Tzadok acknowledges that something changed and something developed. And I think more than anything else, based off of everything that we've been discussing, that there was some sort of development, that there was some sort of change in the world, Rav Tzadok really gets to the heart of why such a change is necessary and what are the theological Theological archetypes. What is guiding these changes? Why is this necessary in the world? Why not have it <laughs> given in a more direct way, in a more simplistic way, so to speak? Just give us the book of the rules. Why do we have this kind of period where we are guided from a more prophetic experience and then we kind of shift to an experience that comes through the interpretive community, through the Bale Hamasora, the interpretive community 
that not only invest authority in the oral law, but are the ones who explicate it, build upon it generation after generation. And I obviously, we obviously don't have enough time to go through all the writings of Rip Tzadok. I just really want to highlight three important thinkers in this area and then try to get like a nugget, like the core essential idea of what is animating his thought. The first person is my teacher who I've written about in Tradition. I was invited to contribute to Tradition Journal in the fall of 2020, volume 52, number four. And I contributed an article called Jewish Thought, a Process, Not a Text. And in that article, which is really all about Reb Tzadok and his influence on me, I spoke about Reb Tzadok's contribution through the three teachers who brought me to Reb Tzadok. And one of those teachers, who really is the first person to write about Reb Tzadok in English, and it's a series of articles that we have on our website, and you can check that out, of course, at 1840.org, and that is Dr. Yaakov Elman. And you want to be sure to check out all of his articles. Again, check out the website. The second person who I actually came to even beforehand and was briefly a guest on 1840, that is Rabbi Jeremy Kagan. He has a fantastic book it's in English. He has multiple books, but the one that really resonated with me is called The Jewish Self. And you'll see why the title is so important. We've been talking about the origins of Judaism, the interaction of prophetic Judaism and rabbinic Judaism. His book is about the Jewish self and the formation of our self and kind of a historiography of what it means to be involved in Yiddishkeit, how religion itself has evolved through time. It's an absolutely fascinating work, and I strongly recommend for anybody who wants to get a better understanding. But the last person, who's probably the least accessible, not just as a personality, as a person, though I've had many, many conversations with her, and I'm not, I don't want to make a promise, but I want to hope and continue to pray that she joins as a guest on 1840, because her work has been such an influence influence on my life, and that is Professor Amira Lever. And she wrote her PhD, which again is available on our website, and her PhD is called Torah Shabal Peh Bekisve Reb This is a monumental work. It is more than 500 pages. It is in Hebrew, most of it in academic Hebrew, but she is an incredible person. I've never met with her in person. I've spoken to her on the phone a few times, and I really want to recommend that. And I want to begin just kind of explicating at the heart of Reb Sadek what his idea is and why it's so essential with the introductory quote to her PhD. And she begins with a quote from Reb Sadek in his work, Lakute Mahamaram, on the 90th page in the old print. And Reb Sadek writes as follows, Vilakach, and therefore, Tachlis kol Torah Shabal Peh, the point of the entire Torah Shabal Peh, who rak chachmas vilimudim eich lahagiel ledavrzeh. It is a teaching, it is the wisdom of how to reach this. What is this? Ladas to know, she'ein lanu me'atzmenu klum, rak ma'asha Hashem Yisbarach nosein. That we of ourselves really have nothing, it is all ultimately from God. The Uz Mimela Hashem Yisbarach, and through that, God Shofea Chachma Bukal Echad Vayechad Hamiyacha Lachazdo bestows upon every individual who anticipate and yearns for God's goodness, for God's kindness. And I think that opening quote says so much that the entire project of Torah Shabbat Alpeh is a way, Eich Lahagia Ladavarze, is a way to reach this. What is this? Ladas, the knowledge, She'ein Lanu Me'atzmenu, Klum, Rakma Hashem Yisbarach Nosein. And I think at the heart of everything that this knowledge that our very sense of self, our very selves emerges from God as well, really gets to the heart of the dichotomy that Reb Tzadok understands and approaches this difference between prophetic Judaism and rabbinic Judaism and this switch. At the heart of it in the writing of Reb Tzadok, and he writes theologically, though many of his works are halachic, he wrote responsa, many of his works include Lumdus, this is a person who the entire corpus of Torah Shabal Peh, of the oral law throughout the generations was at his fingertips. And you really see it. It's not story tales. It's something that you see on every page of his writing. But at the heart of the dichotomy is the paradox that animates the entire world, which is the paradox between divine foreknowledge and free will. At the heart of any religious thinking person's mind, there is a paradox that exists that nearly every religious thinker has approached. That if, in fact, there is a God, if, in fact, there is a creator of the world, 
world who knows all, who is omniscient, then we live in a deterministic world that is called divine foreknowledge. He knows what is going to happen. Yet at the same time, there is a notion of free will, that we have a sense of self. The entire purpose of the world was to create a world where man can arrive, where humanity can arrive at the knowledge of God through their own free will, through their own choice, and discover, so to speak, godliness in the world. I believe it is the dichotomy between determinism and free will, between a world that is subsumed within godliness and a world that is separated, so to speak, from God, that only emerges through our choice, through our own discovery, is at the heart of this shift. In the works of Reb Tzadok, the prophetic world that we once lived in was a world of limited choice, where choice was more limited, where God's presence was much more palpable and much more realizable. And slowly the world unfolded and shifted into a world of Bechira, of free will. And this deliberately came through time and over time because the very dichotomy, the very paradox between free will and determinism, between the written Torah and the oral Torah, is the same phenomenology, is the same distinction that we have in the writings of Reb Tzadok that we find between place and time. A place, in Hebrew, a makom, a place, does not require the unfolding of time. A safer Torah, the words on the page do not exist within the context of time, comes out in a flash. That is the moment of revelation. And we contend with that moment of revelation over time and through time. And that is the world of Torah Sheba al the oral Torah, which deliberately unfolds through time itself. There is a fantastic book that I've recommended before. I may have even quoted this exact passage. The book is by Alan Lightman, and it's called Einstein's Dreams. And as I think I mentioned, he has this one story in Einstein's dreams where he imagines a world that operates where time is a sense, where time is a sense like your sense of smell, your sense of touch, your sense of sight. Imagine time was a sense and different people had different senses of time. How would that work? It's one of the few fiction books I've ever read. Every chapter imagines what Einstein was dreaming about when he's coming up with his theory of relativity. And in this chapter where time is a sense, it ends with this amazing, amazing thought experiment where he writes, some few people are born without any sense of time. As consequence, their sense of place becomes heightened to excruciating degree. They lie in tall grass and are questioned by poets and painters from all over the world. These time deaf are beseeched to describe the precise placement of trees in the spring, the shape of snow in the Alps, the angle of sun on a church, the position of rivers, the location of moss, the pattern of birds in a flock, yet the time deaf are unable to speak what they know, for speech needs a sequence of words spoken in time. That is the world of Torah Sheba al where our very sense of self, our very Torah, unfolds throughout time, and in contention, in dialogue with the Torah Sheba And these two archetypes were the moment of revelation, which does not unfold in time, it is kind of like a moment, a flash, is the written Torah, And that is the world of prophetic Judaism, so to speak. It's the world that's described in Tanakh, where God is revealed in this top-down space, like on, on a mountain, on Har Sinai, so to speak. And slowly that vision dims. We don't live in that world forever because our ability to choose within that world is somewhat limited. And slowly we move away into the world of Bechira, into the world of free will, the exilic world, where our ability to find God, to discover transcendence, to develop Torah, comes deliberately through human interpretation, through the darkness of God's revelation. We don't see it explicitly. There are no more open miracles. There's no palatable divine presence, but divine presence in self is manifest through our own sense of self, through our interpretations, through what's embodied by Knesset Yisroel, through the collective body of the Jewish people. And it is specifically in the world of the oral law that we need the function of time, not just to speak, but in the unfolding of tradition itself, every generation in dialogue with the generation that came before it. You know, people always ask me, like, according to this, how do you know who's right? How do you know maybe we should all join and become Hasidim, or maybe we should all go and become a little bit more relaxed or more lenient and go with the masses? And I think part of the answer is the certain 
certainty of knowing is much less clear in the present moment. You really require a little bit of the hand of history to guide us and to know what's right. And that's part of the ambiguity of exile. It's part of the responsibility and heaviness of choice itself. And we need that unfolding of time that all of the oral law is built upon that guides each and every generation. It's why the very acronym for the orders of the Mishnah, Zra, Moed, Nashim, Nazikim, Kachim, Taharos, which are the six orders of the Mishnah, spell an acronym of Zman Nakat, choosing time. It is that choice within time, that unfolding of tradition throughout the generations, that the majesty of Torah Shabbal Peh emerges from. And it is in this world of choice, this exilic world that we live in, where Torah flourished. And the point of Torah is not to bask in the beauty of our choice, but to merge the world of choice back and reconnect it to the world of divine foreknowledge. To reconnect the world of Bechira, which is the Hebrew word for choice, to the world of Yediya. To be able to find godliness and presence even in our very sense of self, even in our human interpretations, even in the guiding hand of history. To look at that even in the apparent absence of explicit divinity, to say that there is God there as well, which is why the great revelation of the oral law flourished after the destruction of the Beis HaMegdash, flourished in the shadow, in the wake of destruction, which is why the very verse in which the Talmud couches itself and describes itself is from the third chapter of Eicha, where the Talmud says, which I'll just say parenthetically, and I know we've probably lost a lot of people in this series. It's been a, a little a little intense, and you know, hopefully you look at the show notes and the articles that proceed a little bit more sequentially. But in the third chapter of Eicha, of Lamentations, which is kind of the this poetic response to the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash, the entire third chapter, I believe, are the roots of centering Torah as the vehicle for self-expression and for re- discovering the divinity that was lost in the temple. And in the sixth verse of the third chapter, it writes, You placed me in darkness among the dead. And the Talmud in Tractate Sanhedrin on the 24th page says that this verse refers to the project of Talmud. Talmud is about the rediscovery of God through choice, through our own free will, through our interpretation, through the darkness of exile and being able to rediscover the explicit God associated with prophecy, associated with that world of divine foreknowledge where there's a plan for everything. And merging those two worlds, like that quote we began with, which is the quote that Amira Lever begins her entire PhD with on Reb Tzadok, to come to that ultimate realization that even our sense of self, even our religious capacity, even that journey, even our own personal experiential narrative is also from God and is also a part of that story. And the Torah that emerges from our own experience is part of Torah as well in the world of Reb Tzadok. But in that world of Reb Tzadok, everything comes back to this world shift between the world of divine foreknowledge, of open miracles, of a world that is openly connected to God, a world described with miracles, with angels, the world described that we have in Tanakh, and then the lights go out. And we live in the world that we live in today, and it's that world that is unfolding through darkness where... We need to kind of construct and figure out and interpret what our purpose is. And I think these two worlds, that world of clarity and that world of darkness that I think is represented by Torah Shabbat Peh, I think everyone intuitively understands or has experienced this in their own lives, in their own sense of self. It is like the very unfolding of Torah mirrors the unfolding of our own individual selves, where we're born, so to speak, and we have this embryonic meaning and purpose in the world. We were brought into the world for a purpose. And then the moment we come into the world, it seems like we are bereft. As we come into ourself, it gets more and more confusing. There's more and more doubt. And we have points in our life where it could be total darkness. We don't even know why we're alive anymore. We don't believe in ourselves. We don't believe that there is a purpose, a direction to ourselves. And the very phenomenology of Torah Shabbat Peh, of taking texts that contradict, taking opinions that contradict, and finding and constructing meaning through that darkness is 
I believe, the very way that we construct a sense of self. That we're born and we have this period where like God brought us into the world and then our very sense of self, like Torah Shabbat like the oral law, slowly unfolds in each period in our lives until hopefully by the end of our life that initial purpose and the very end of our lives cohere and merge together where we finally are able to embody that purpose. And I look at Torah Shabbat Peh that way. When somebody tells me, are you telling me that Torah Shabbat Peh, it wasn't given by God, the oral law wasn't given directly by God? I said, in a transcendent sense, of course. The same way in a transcendent sense, my life has a purpose. But it's sometimes not apparent and it's sometimes not clear. And that purpose has to come through discovery, through resolution and negotiation, and figuring out how all the different periods in my life cohere into some central picture, some central narrative that gives purpose to my life. And that can be lost and it's not always clear. It can sometimes feel that our lives itself is bamachashakim hoshivaini kemese olam. We're placed in darkness among the dead. And I think Reb Tzadok is negotiating in the, his approach to the distinction between Torah Shebech Sav and Torah Shebel Peh as this world of divinity, divine foreknowledge versus this world of Bechira and choice and doubt and ambiguity. Reb Tzadok is really negotiating finding meaning not just in Torah, but this is parallel in our very own lives where our very sense of self can become in a sense a part of Torah and it's this negotiation and it's this sense of feeling and sometimes purposelessness and our human drive to find purpose to construct purpose and wed it to that original transcendent idea for why we're here is not just the project of Torah, but it's the project of life itself. And being a part of this and connecting to your own life in each period in your life, and then in a macro sense, connecting your life to all the unfolding generations is the very beauty and very majesty of what Torah is all about. And this, I believe, is the very project of Torah Shabbat Peh, which is seeking meaning. And I want to read one paragraph before we go into our interview. And again, I'm so sorry for the long introductions during this entire series. I just really think this requires framing because some of these ideas can be, if misunderstood, can erode faith when what we're really trying to do is build faith. And that is an article that was written by my teacher, Dr. Yaakov Elman. He has a phenomenal article that you, you, you're you not even going to get it if you try to read it once. Even the title is hard to understand. The article is called Progressive Durash and Retrospective Shot, non halachic considerations in Talmud Torah. And he has one paragraph, one really amazing paragraph, where he discusses this notion of omni-significance, this commitment that we have in Torah to find meaning, even when on a more basic, more literal meaning, or maybe in a plain reading, there is a contradiction. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't cohere with one another. But the entire project of Torah is about omni-significance in insisting and finding meaning in all of the texts. Of Torah. And he has one paragraph that I found so beautiful and so amazing where he really connects this project and this desire to find omni significance in Torah, even when two verses contradict, even when two passages in Talmud contradict, even when two halachos, whether it's in the Rishonim or in the Shulchan Aruch, even when they contradict, we then find a larger conceptual frame to resolve those contradictions. That very project is part of life itself. And this is what he writes, Dr. Elman, in his article. He says, in this unreconstructed world, whereas information theory teaches us, entropy and disorder increase in the realm of knowledge and its transmission no less than in the material world, the principle of omnisignificance serves as a bulwark against disorder. It is the Torah's analog of the law of conservation of matter and energy. Omnisignificance smooths the jagged edges of contradiction and redundancy. But those edges remain to goad us on to new and more inclusive systematization, to allow scope for the intellectually edifying to overcome the world's irrationality, which at base mirror this world's basic hostility to truth, the intellectual equivalent to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, so to speak. In this sense, the Torah too is in exile. 
omnisignificance, this search for meaning, is a foretaste of the world of tikkun, that world of reconciliation. And I think that world, that exilic world of contradiction and redundancy, that repetition that seems so meaningless, we experience it not only in Torah, we experience it in our lives. And the experience, the phenomenology, the tools that we have in resolving those contradictions, whether it is in the Torah, whether it's in the Talmud, whether it's in the Rishonim, are the very tools that we use to construct the Jewish self, our individual self, and the larger self of Knesset Yisroel. And that is the emergence of the Jewish people through prophecy and then rediscovering that world post-destruction through the flourishing of Torah Sheba al and is without further ado, I want to introduce not just Rav Tzadok's thought, but the world of Rav Kook. And Rav Tzadok and Rav Kook, I just want to mention, never knew each other personally. Rav Kook, I believe, heard about the writings of Rav Tzadok. They never met. And there are many wonderful works that compare their theology. There's a fantastic sefer. There's a book called Ahavas Tzedek. Again, it's written entirely in Hebrew. So I apologize to many of our listeners that may not be accessible to you, but they're always in parallel parallel thought, and they are sometimes called Shnei Kohanim Gedolim, the two great Kohanim, the two great Kohanes, because both Reb Tzadok and Rev Kook were Kohanim, and did this holy work of trying to restore honor and integrity of the oral law in this ever-confusing world. And I could think of no better guest than my dearest friend, somebody who I know for many, many years and who has expertise in so many fields, as you'll discover in the interview. Without further ado, my conversation with Dr. Yosef Bronstein. I am so excited to introduce one of my oldest and dearest friends. He really is an incredibly accomplished person, teaches in Yeshiva University in MMY, has a doctorate, I believe, which we'll hear more about from from my teacher and professor, Dr. Yaakov Elman, but I could be wrong. We'll hear more about that in a moment. But I remember him most fondly that he was the speaker at my smicha ordination, at my event when I got smicha, my chag ha smicha. It is my absolute privilege and pleasure to introduce my friend, Rabbi Dr. Yosef Bronstein. Thank you so much, Rabbi David. It is a pleasure to be here. It's so interesting because I feel like we've really been in touch over the years, kind of very sporadically, but we have a lot of overlapping interests. And the reason why I specifically wanted to speak with you on this topic is we're exploring kind of the origins of rabbinic Judaism, which is a loaded term that not everybody likes. I don't like it. I like Yiddishkeit. I don't use the term rabbinic Judaism when people ask me, you know, what religion are you? I don't check off rabbinic Judaism. I like Yiddishkeit. But what I think makes you unique is that you're really accomplished in three different overlapping areas. One is you did a PhD, no specific order. The title of your PhD was? Honeyitic Legal Arguments for Israel's Observance of the Divine Law. In uh, proper English, that means why are Jews obligated to keep mitzvos? Why are we obligated to keep mitzvos? But you really go back and try to explore how this was posed in drushos, how this was unfolded in the edifice that we now know as Chazal, so to speak, how that unfolded. And you did an academic PhD. And then in a second area, I knew you and first knew you as one of the, and you're going to kill me for saying this, but one of the absolute superstars in the base medrash. There was buzz about you. I always love, like, the buzz of like who's going where in Israel like who are the biggest prospects in Israel I always compare it to like NFL draft picks NBA draft picks and you were a very sought after draft pick in Israel I could see your face getting very serious you hate speaking about your own intellectual prowess or accomplishments but you were courted to go to a lot of Israel yeshivas the salary was pretty commensurate I would say with the first <laughs> round draft pick for the NBA or NFL but yes <laughs> when I was in Yeshiva University you sat in in the back right corner and you sat and sat. You began in Eretz Yisrael as a Talmud in KBY and then switched midway to Gush to learn under of Aaron Lichtenstein, I believe. That is correct. And you were one of the outstanding members of Rev Rosenzweig Shear. You were in a Shear for many years. How many years were in a Shear for? I was in the Shear formally, I think for three or four years, but then I continued in the Kolel and he was the one giving in and leading our study in the Kolel for years afterwards. When I first 
first met you, you were like one of the serious, you know, tell me them of Rev Rosenzweig, Rev Aaron Lichtenstein had a very specific approach. I could mention your father-in-law is also a Rosh in YU, Rabbi Reichman, and you've had a very serious hand in putting out the, I used the one on Sukkah when it came out, and I know I'm going to butcher the name. It's a red volume, Kuntros... I'm thinking control say Shiurim, but that's Rav Gusman. That's Rav Gusman. It's Rishimos Shiure Miran Harab Salvechak. Miran Har Great Halevi Salvechak. The Rishimos, the red volumes that when I was in high school, I think it was just Sukkah that was out, and it was fantastic, and you've put out, and you've been involved in editing several volumes, and I believe when this comes out, the volume on Kiddushin is going to be published. It is correct. That's the only one I've had a strong hand in, in writing. You have bona fides in the academic world. You have bona fides in the base medrash world. But there's a third area, which is really at the heart of why I invited you, and that is midway through. It was not initially when I first met you. Midway through, you developed, maybe it was in secret beforehand, a very real love for the writings and thought of Rav Cook. Just to correct one point, and I'm not sure if it was midway through YU, I actually spent several months in Yeshiva Merkaz Harav, in Rav Cook's Yeshiva, between Gush and my turn Yeshiva, Yeshiva University. Partially, it was to be able to study study of Cook's writings from in the location where he himself taught or in the same edifice of yeshiva where he himself taught from his own students and student students. What I really want to start with is Rav Cook and then refract some of his thought back onto your experiences kind of in a more, I don't know, standard traditional shear in the base medrash and then reflect it also back on your experiences as an academic. And I was wondering if we could begin with that third pillar, which is your experience and your study of the works of Rav Cook. And my opening question is, you grew up in Bayswater. You went to a fair, I, I don't want to jump into stereotypes, but I'm going to use the term. It's an ugly term. I don't like the term. I knew you as a fairly typical gush guy, which has evolved. You were a serious Talmud, Rishonim, Shas, and Poskim, the Talmud and all of its commentators kind of person. You did not strike me as somebody who would ever be drawn to the more poetic theological writings of Rav Cook. What on earth drew you? Who introduced you? We even put that idea in your head that there was something that would work that you needed to discover in the writings of Rav Cook. Thank you for putting the question that way. I think you basically answered it through the question itself, as all good questioners do. I had studied in MTA, which is Yeshiva University's high school. I did a year of learning in Yeshiva University, a year of college before going to Israel. Then I went to Israel, and even in Karen Biavna, I started hearing Divrei Torah quoting Rav Cook. And it was something new. The language was a more spiritualized language. The language is more experiential. And the ideas were very sophisticated. And they opened up my eyes to new ways of thinking about things. And that really got me going. I remember when I was in Gush, which is not the most typical place where Israelis at least study the thought of Rav Kook, I probably opened up the book or wrote and read the first passage a dozen times by myself, trying to make heads and tails and trying to figure it out until I admitted defeat. And I found myself an older Israeli Kabrusa and started working through the, the writings with. And I think the answer to your question, what drew me to it, was the Shiloh, was an integration of those two elements that you mentioned. Number one was raw spirituality. Here you had somebody that was writing experientially, writing from a vantage point of somebody who knows God, feels God, is close to God. But on the other hand, in, in a complementary fashion, he really knew Kol Torah Kuba. He was an expert in every area of Torah, from Gemara and Halakha to Kabbalah and mysticism. And the ideas, the writing, as poetic and as passionate as they are, they are extremely sophisticated and creative and innovative. And that integration really really, really drew me in. I want to begin because we're talking about the development of rabbinic Judaism and throughout I've been talking about kind of these three models of how different communities and it's like kind of a spectrum. There are three models I understand the way people look at the Judaism we practice today. One model which I think is maybe I mean you could negatively call it fundamentalist. It's sometimes like you'll see it in like Haredi children's books you know where they have pictures of biblical characters wearing a strimal and a Bekisha, is you take the present, the Yiddishkeit we know today, and you project it onto the past. So what we do now is what we've always been doing. This is our relationship to halacha, to Torah, to mitzvahs. This is how it has always been, and nothing has changed. That's model number one. Model number two is the exact opposite, and I think this was championed by a lot of early reform writers. We take the past, and we try to superimpose it on the present. We see that the way Judaism was described 
described in the books of the prophets, in the books of Tanakh. It's not the Judaism we see today. Where are the Bate Medrash? Where's the conversations that we're familiar with that are taking place around Gemara and around Drushas and Halacha and all of these things? Something must have been corrupted. Let's take that past, that prophetic Judaism, and superimpose it onto the present. And that was the program of early reform. There must have been a corruption by rabbinic Judaism. Let's take the past and superimpose on the present. There is a third path, which I believe was championed by many thinkers. I think most notably Rav Cook spells it out most clearly. I would also put in that category Rav Tzadok HaKohen Melublin, who talks about a necessary historical development of Torah and how it came to the people. Am I characterizing Rav Cook properly? How would you characterize Rav Cook's understanding of the emergence of what we call today Judaism? I think you're correct to situate Rav Cook between those two poles because this wasn't the original reason why I was drawn to Rav Cook. I wasn't drawn to him for his historical essays, but I still remember late one Friday night in Gush after I came back from the Tesh. I was in my room. One of my roommates happened to have the book he wrote. Who's running a Tish in Gush? Just, I need to get a little more details there. Rav Amitan was still alive and well then. He was running Tish and Rav Lickelstein used to run Tish it was It was wow. a very beautiful situation. Beautiful. There was a little corner with amazing acoustics where people would sing afterwards. It was a really, really beautiful situation. So I came back to my room and my roommate had the book he wrote out on the desk. He was already sleeping. And I started skimming through it because I was already getting interested in Rav Cook. And I came across this essay, the Malachi Diot Yisrael, the development of ideas amongst the Jewish people in Israel. And I probably sat there for three hours trying to read through it. It's a fairly long essay, as I'm sure you're familiar. But that was probably the first historical essay from Rav Kook that I read, retraces certain ideas throughout the Jewish history. You also just repeat one more time. What is the name of this essay? What does it mean? And where can it be found? So this name of the essay is the Mahalach HaIdiyot Israel. It usually translated as the development of ideas or ideals in Israel. It can be found Found in the book Orot, a lot of the books Orot have a second word in the title. This is just plain Orot in the middle of the book. You will find a, probably a 20-page essay there. It was originally published in some journal, and it was then republished in the book Orot by Rav Kook himself. And as I became more familiar with Rav Kook, I realized that he has several other historical essays. You can go through them one by one if you want. But altogether, they create a very holistic and very comprehensive approach to the development of Jewish history. And on the one hand, Rav Kook is a traditional rabbi. He believes that the Torah was given at Sinai, Halakha was given at Sinai. Jews kept Halakha from the time of Moshe Rabbeinu all the way through the prophetic period. He doesn't believe that Jewish law was a complete fabrication of the rabbis in the end of the Second Temple period or the post-destruction of the Second Temple period. But at the same time, he's reading text. And at the same time, he's aware of the fact that the Judaism presented in Tanakh seems radically different than the Judaism presented in the Mishnah and the Talmud and subsequent what we call rabbinic Judaism. Can you give me an example of that distinction that Rav Kook notices or kind of where's the tension that's drawing out this theory that we'll get to in a moment. Is there a glaring example of like you reading Tanakh and I have my own, but I'm curious if Rav Cook mentions or you have any of your own that you're like, this does not sound like the Judaism that we know of. Well, I think Rav Cook has four historical essays. Each one points out something that is a major difference as Judaism presented in Tanakh and Judaism presented by the Mishnah and Talmud. And after reading through them, after reading each essay, it strikes you as obvious that such a distinction exists. And it's hard to paper over the distinctions once you're familiar with them. Do you want me to pick out one or just to list? Yeah, pick out one or two. I'm curious which ones jump out at you. For me, I think that the most succinct formulation of the idea is in an essay entitled Chacham Adif Minavi, that the sage is greater than the prophet. It's also in the book Orot. It's in the Zero Onim section. It's a two-page essay. And there, of course, points out what I think you pointed out, that the early reform rabbis, early academics, the Wissenschaft people pointed out, that Judaism of the prophets seems to be very focused on general moral principles. These are the verses that appear on the walls of the UN. These are the psukim that have inspired morality for everybody through Martin Luther King, through Barack Obama, all the way to modern times. And these are very beautiful, poetic, inspirational verses. And this is what people refer to as biblical morality. But there's no mention of halakha. There's nothing about tying your left shoe before your right shoe. Or what happens if your milchik spoon falls into your fleshic path? Or things of that sort. When you get to the Mishnah, which you know, was written in the year, let's say, 200 CE. So we're talking about, let's say, the prophetic period ended around the year 500, 500 BC. We're talking about 700 years later. You get a very different picture of Judaism. You get a very detailed-oriented picture of Judaism. And Rav Kook refers to these general values as 
being swallowed up within the details, so much so that it's hard to see them. So that is one distinction our book draws. Another distinction is who is the subject? Who is God talking to? In Tanakh, almost always, God is talking to the nation as a whole. Scar of Onish, reward and punishment in Tanakh is all about the nation. We will hardly find a verse referring to reward and punishment of the individual person. So much so that only we show them are bothered. Where is Olam Abba? Where is the world to come in Tanakh? Then, if you open up a Mishnah, who is the Mishnah talking about? It's talking wow. to the individual person. I love this. What is my obligation when I, when I wake up in the morning? I don't remember this. That is such a fascinating distinction. In Tanakh, God speaks of the nation of the Jewish people. And any Mishnah, almost all of them, I mean, maybe one or two exceptions jump out. When they talk about following the law, it's all on the individual level. On the individual. Fascinating. Rav Cook points out that the stories of the Abba Tanakh about individuals, almost, not always, but almost always, are individuals that have a large national role. The prophet, the king, the political leader. You don't have stories about the sage, so to speak. You don't have stories about the individual Joe Shmo. Correct. You have stories with Isha Shanamis. There are stories here and there, but we're talking about, by and large, the stories about individual people are the people that have a very large national and criminal role. A third major distinction is something that really blew me away, is not just about the content of Judaism, not just about who is God talking to, but what is the relationship that the people have with God. In Tanakh, the relationship people have with God is palpable. Rav Kook, in the third essay, called Derech HaTechiyah, the way of the revival, Rav Kook refers to this as Zerim Psichi Ruchani, a psychic spiritual current. Psychic spiritual current. Sign me up. Wow. That is a literal English translation of Rav Kook's Hebrew. He was clearly making up the term in Hebrew to try to capture what does it mean to be living in a time period where you could see Elio and Navi, and you realize that's an Ishadokim. Elio and Navi davins that people should open up their eyes, and all of a sudden they see angels around them. There was a palpable spiritual feeling which I'm sure, you, as you're familiar from Asado, could either be geared towards God or it could be geared towards idolatry, towards paganism. But this spirituality was part of the vibe of the world. But once we get to the Mishnah, the people don't talk directly to God. Again, there is some continuity. The book is always careful to point out. There is a Basco, and we assume, we'll talk about this, we assume the sages, the Chachamim, have some divine intuition. But we're shifting from a world of a prophet, and the prophet is leading people to feel close to God, to something of Cook calls Zerem Ruchani Limudi, an academic spirituality. That you study the text, you study Torah, you study Halakha, and that is the ultimate way to connect to God, Talmud Torah connected Kuba. So n- not just the content of Judaism, the club and the general principles versus the project versus details, not just who is God talking to, the nation or the individual, but also the very content of Judaism in terms of the way we relate to God also seems to have a different vibe, seems to have a different texture. Explain to me, he points out these fascinating distinctions in the world that emerges from the world of Tanakh and the Judaism that we know today. What you're describing, the world of the Mishnah, in many ways is closer to me than just like the, a common person living there. My Rebbe once told me, I've quoted this before, Rev Ezra Newberger one time said, he wasn't talking to me specifically, he's talking to the whole class. You have more in common with the Tanoim and Amaroyim, with the sages of the Mishnah and the Talmud, than with a common everyday Jew who lived in the time of the prophets. We're living in different worlds, different universes verses that weren't happening. So I'm curious, what does Rev Cook do with these distinctions? He's clearly noticing that something has changed or developed or there's some tension. How does he go about explaining this? So this is where Rev Cook is perhaps unique in taking what was pointed out in some earlier Jewish sources, but it was also pointed out by the founders of, of academic Jewish studies and by reform rabbis, but really pulling it in a much more traditional from direction. Two points. First of all, for Rev Cook, there are no hard breaks. There is always halakha, there's always a focus on the individual. But the question is, what is the emphasis? What is the overall message? So that's point A. And point B, Rav Cook points out, is that you would think that the biblical Judaism is beautiful. You would think that the biblical Judaism is the ideal. Yet, if you look at Tanakh, the prophets utterly failed in their own enterprise. By the end of the time period of the prophets, the Jewish society was one that was rampant with idolatry, was rampant with murder, was rampant with corruption. So on the one hand, you have this very beautiful picture of Judaism, focusing on nationalism, focusing on relationship with God, and focusing on the general values. But on the other hand, it totally, utterly failed in its own mission. And that's where Cook points out that you need to have this, he doesn't refer to it as dialectic, but many of Cook scholars refer to it as a, as a Hegelian dialectic. Rav Cook read Hegel, was influenced by Hegel. On the one hand, you have Bayes Rishon Judaism, First Temple Judaism, the Biblical Judaism. And then the major fulcrum is when prophecy leaves the beginning of the Second Temple period. And then you have a more 
quiet, more toned down, more academic form of Judaism, one that focuses on the details of halacha. The details of halacha that aren't totally broken and aren't totally ruptured from the general values, but it's hard to see them. A Judaism that focuses on the individual, Judaism that focuses on, on academic study, where you find remnants of the first temple Judaism, but second temple Judaism and Judaism of second temple throughout the long exile is something that's more sustainable, something that creates a framework for each individual Jew in their own lives, whether or not they feel close to God or not, they know what to do. They know when they wake up in the morning, I as an individual person have to say modani, wash my hands, tie my left shoe before my right shoe. So the great values of Judaism are encapsulated within these details, but the details, even though they're tamer, they're less exciting, but they are create a framework that sustains Judaism throughout the long gullus, throughout the long exile, when Judaism no longer has perhaps that amazing shine, that amazing vibe. One more point though, is that for a cook, this is exactly the uniqueness of the 20th century, that Second Temple Judaism, exilic Judaism wasn't working anymore majority of Jews were leaving the fold. They were leaving Torah observance. And Rav Cook's analysis of the situation was that not that we have to return to biblical Judaism, but as the messianic process unfolds, as the Jewish people returning to the land of Israel, as there are other indications in the world as a whole that things are advancing, we have to slowly but surely reintegrate the biblical Judaism, first temple Judaism, into our existing structures. This means we have to change the curriculum a little bit. This means we have to focus on, on spirituality. It means we have to focus on nationalism, on Zionism, on the land, without letting go of halakha, of the deep details of everything that's there, but we have to reintegrate, create a synthesis between the first temple Judaism and second temple Judaism. And that's where Rav Kook was going with it. And that's kind of the struggle of modernity, meaning in this framework, there's this major transition with the cessation of prophecy, the world changes, God is not as palpable, nationhood, feeling a part of that nation is not as obvious, not as real to people, and everything becomes more individuated. Now, we've lived in that world and a lot of people have left, have assimilated, it doesn't relate to people in many, many ways. To Rav Cook, if I'm understanding you correctly, the Messianic age, which doesn't mean literally the coming of Mashiach, but this awakening of modernity that came through modernity is about this synthesis between that moral, palpable godliness that existed in the world in the First Temple period and the more individuated academic approach, so to speak, where your own personal grappling with texts and ideas can then be synthesized with that national idea of God. Yeah, exactly. And and for Cook, he viewed himself and his generation as the beginning of this transition. And the reason why so many Jews were leaving the fold was because they were still being taught the same way they were being taught in Cheder 500 years ago, which was fine for the people that were the Neshamos, the souls that were in the world for 500 years ago. But as we approach the Messianic era, we need a different model. And the model's already there. We just have to reintegrate it into the Judaism that exists. I want to kind of like reflect back and the other pillars that we spoke about that you've been involved in in your life, not only only Riff Cook, but also these ideas from Riff Cook into the world of your academic studies and into kind of your upbringing in the base medrash. I think I'm going to start with the academic studies. Your thesis focused on what exactly? Elaborate a little bit more, not just the title. What was the question that you were trying to figure out? So the question I was trying to figure out was, was a little bit philosophical. It's what's the authority of the divine law? Meaning all groups in Second Temple Judaism and beyond assume that the Jewish people were obligated to observe the divine law. The question was, what was the basis for that commitment? So my argument was that if you look in different groups in Second Temple period, look in the Dead Sea Scrolls, look in the Book of Jubilees, look in, look in Ben Sira, there's a commonality. They all want the Jews to observe the commandments, but they talk about it. They talk about the authority of the commandments in different ways. Once you get to Midrash Halacha, once you get to Tani Edik Midrash, which is the same people that are quoted in the Mishnayos, more, more or less, like the foundational people of our Tarash of Alpeh, so they have a specific understanding of why the Jewish people were obligated to observe the divine law. And what's that? My argument is that it's a legal argument. That is the argument you get if you read Tanakh. If you look in the book of Jubilees, you look in the Dead Scrolls, it's more, this is just like the way God created the world. The sun rises in the east, sets in the west. The Jewish people are there from day one. The book of Jubilees integrates the choice of the election of the Jewish people into the creation story because you can't have a world that without the Jewish people, they're just part of the fabric of reality. You mess up the fabric of reality. You corrupt everything. The Jewish people don't observe the law. If you read Tani Edik Medrash, my argument is, I hope it's a true argument, is that you get a different picture. You get the picture which you would get if, if you read Chumash straight that 
there is God and there's the Jewish people, and they're treated as two legal entities, and there's an historical narrative. And at some point in that historical narrative, something happens that obligates the Jewish people to observe the, God's law and obligates God to do some things for the Jewish people. And then, then the next level of the argument is that there are different tiny edict schools which consistently focus on different points. Either it's the exodus of Egypt. My argument is, is that that is the Rebbe Akiva school, that God acquired the Jewish people as slaves when he took them out of Egypt. And the Rabbi Ishmael school argues that the Jewish people volitionally accepted God as their king at our scene, at Mount Santor, at the giving of Zara. So the topic itself is not so related, to, I think, to our general conversation. I think it's extraordinarily related. I really do. And we've spoken about this. I mean, most of our conversations, maybe it's, it says more about me than it does about you. Most of our conversations took place in the fifth floor of the Yeshiva University Library. Though we had some conversations in the base measures in more typical learning, which we'll get to. But I do remember you sharing this idea with me, particularly about the schools of Rebbe Akiva and Rebbe Yishmal and how they relate to Medrash. I'm wondering if you could, aside from being a academic and Talmud Chacham and all these other things, you're also a teacher. And I happen to think, and so many people who reach out to 1840 kind of reach out for this very question that we're dealing with, which is, if you're not in school of thought number one, where you project the present onto the past, it's always been this way. And you acknowledge that there has been some development, some change. The corpus of halacha as we know it today, I mean, certainly the Rambam says this nearly explicitly. Most of the jurashas, most of the midrashe halacha at the center of your PhD, we don't believe were in a national sense given at Sinai. Many of them were extrapolated and developed much later. We have mitzvahs that were given at Sinai. We have the basic understanding of them, but a lot of the details and the development of the law came much, much later. And I know from a lot of people, it's like, what obligates me to do this exactly? Like, why should I listen to this? I want to serve God. I don't want to serve, you know, and they always say it pejoratively, like it's an illness, like the measles, the mumps. I don't want to serve the rabbis, the rabbis, like it's some contagious illness. Did your understanding, did your motivation, did your relationship to how you personally or how you teach the relationship to halacha change through your academic study? I'm not sure if my relationship changed. The way I teach changed is because based on I, I have a different, I guess, orientation or vantage point right now. And I, ju I, ju I just want to make one correction. Please. I did most of my dissertation work under Professor Elman, and he was the one that really grabbed me into the world of Talmudic studies. He was our mutual teacher, yes. He's our mutual teacher, but he passed away, unfortunately, as he was editing one of the later chapters. Wow. So I actually finished the dissertation under Rabbi Dr. Professor Richard Hittery, who was, he was a fantastic scholar. Sure. Sure, Rabbi, fantastic as a scholar, Tom Hakam, and I owe the world to him for taking a 90% done dissertation and bringing it to the finish line. I would say as follows, that I was never really bothered by the question of development, because like you said, I had read the Rambam's introduction to his commentary on the Mishnah, I read the Rambam in Mishnah Torah. The fact that there is development in Torah Shabbat Pat is something that I think is very basic to the system. There are people that disagree, the Go'onim think everything is from Sinai, there are Rishonim that think everything is from Sinai, but I think the Rambam is the simple understanding of the Gemaras if you would read them. I think any legal system, without any spirituality, without any academic things, without just on a very simple level, every single legal system needs to have the ability to develop. Because I think Rebilsi Albo says this very nicely, says God couldn't put every single new scenario or every single detail into Chumash, it just would have been way too long. And therefore you have to have a system where the foundations, the pillars are there in the Pesukim. There is some explanation that God gives to Moshe at Sinai. The Raman proves that you prove from the Pesukim themselves that there are some things that God told Moshe at Sinai that aren't explicit there in the Pesukim, and the rest is going to be developed. But I think that you're going to find that with any legal system. The unique thing about Torah Shabbat Peh is that, according to the Rambam at least, in addition to God giving us the text of Chumash and certain explanations, God also gave us the hermeneutical tools. God gave us a way to read Chumash extremely carefully to tease out the laws, tease out dinim that are already there latent in the Pesukim. So all of that, I think, is hopefully every Yoshe based Medrash, anybody who's learning, in a, even in a regular based Medrash setting, should be comfortable with that. It's all explicit in the Rambam, I think. I hope it's very intuitive. What Rav Cook gave me, and this is one of the reasons why I got interested in what Dr. Elman was teaching, was that it's not a linear system. If you read the Rambam, the Rambam sounds like from the time of Moshe Rabbeinu until the end of the Talmudic period, until Ravashi, everybody was doing exactly the same thing. They were all reading the Pesukim in exactly the same way, trying to come to exactly the correct conclusion. 
What Rav Cook gives you, and this is what the academic world gives you, is that maybe not. Maybe in a certain generation, the law was a little bit amorphous. The law was very general. And you could trace this throughout the time periods of Chazal, from the first century BCE, to the year zero, to the year 100 CE, all the way to the end of the Gemara, to the end of the Talmudic period. There are certain halakos, certain laws, that will underwent changes. They underwent more details. Some are more threw in a left curve, and all of a sudden, this would get changed. And if you study things chronologically, you reorganize the page of the Talmud, from the way it appears and break it down chronologically, you can see that development. That development could be very scary. But that means maybe, maybe Rav, maybe Rabbi Akiva kept a different halakha than Rabbi Narvashi. And maybe Rabbi Akiva didn't know everything. So what Rav Kook does is that he gives you a framework through which to think about these developments. That yes, that at the beginning of the Tani Yiddish period, things might have been more general, things might have been more amorphous, but the focus of the relationship with God wasn't in the text or the details of Allah per se. Those were there, but the focus of the relationship was on the relationship per se with God. As that wanes, there is an ascent, there's, there's an acceleration on the other side of the ledger. Things get more detailed oriented, things get more complicated, things get more onerous per se, so, so to speak, in terms of the obligations, in terms of how many details there are per mitzvah. And therefore, what the academics, what Dr. Elman was teaching me, that there are certain halakos, you could trace this, it's very general at the beginning, it's more and more detailed as you go on, that actually is not just something you could trace in a page and just say, that's it, great. If Cook gave it meaning, he imbued it with spiritual meaning, and therefore tracing that became part of this grand narrative of Jewish history. Because he read theologically into the development of the oral law itself. I'm curious, do you have a prime example in halacha which you teach to your students on where you could see this, like an easy thing where you kind of see the development over time and those left turns, so to speak? Those. I will be totally honest. I don't teach in an academic setting, per se. My job in Shiva University is more on the Rebbe side. So I talk about these ideas in general, but I don't actually go through text. Is that because it's boring or you think it's dangerous? Or both? Um, not boring or dangerous. I think that there are different functions for people who are in different educational settings, the educational institutions for different reasons. I think focusing on the development of Torah Shabbat is not something that's necessary for all of my students at this stage in their in, in their lives. If I was teaching a graduate class, it would be very different. But I'm usually teaching 18-year-olds, one year out of high school. There's so much basic knowledge that's missing. We could talk about things in general and then focus on the Rambam's categories of Torah Shabbat. It's much more important for them to know the difference between than to trace the development of a particular halacha. But I can give you an example. One of Dr. Elman's early reading assignments, which really caught me, was somebody by the name of Dr. Gitzvah Gilat. He was the head of the Talmud department in Bar Ilan. He caught me also. I never met him. He passed away in 1997. I came to this material much, much later. But he came from the world of the base matter. He learned in Kalm, he learned in Tells, then he came over to Israel pre war. And he studied academically, studied in Hebrew. He was the Talmud of a fine war box. So he does this, he's familiar with the Rishonim, he's familiar with the language of the Bismarck Rish, and he'll take a subject, let's say, of Kavana. How important is intentionality? And he'll show you, Rabbi Eliezer, in general, throughout Shas, plays down the importance of Kavana. It's much more rigid in terms of what are you doing? If you have Kavana, if you have intention to pick a black date, you end up picking a white date, Rabbi Eliezer says, doesn't matter, you pick the white, sorry, on Shabbos, you pick the white date on Shabbos, you violate Shabbos. The other time I disagree. They say no. They say that your intention matters. And you could trace this from the earliest time, and Rabbi Lezer and Herkines was one of the earlier ones that we have, all the way through, I think my colleague, Dr. Shana Schick, who's also a me of Dr. Elman. And did a PhD, sure. She did a PhD under Dr. Elman on this concept of intentionality and damage law. And she tried to show how intention played a very little role in the beginning of the Tanitic period. And as you go on, there are all these sorts of questions. If you're holding a rock and you're not aware the rock is there and you stand up, but you should have known about it. Maybe you didn't know the rock is there and you forgot at some point. You stand up and the rock falls and damages somebody, are you obligated or not? And she shows how intention becomes a more important factor as you go on, as the details really, really increase. Let's turn for a moment, and we might come back to the, you know, kind of the more academic perspective on this, but I want to talk about the hesitation of the base medrash with these ideas. And when I say hesitation, it's a spectrum. Some of them are hesitant, some are outright hostile, and I think for good reason. When I think Geiger first really pushed this idea of prophetic Judaism so the pendulum swung to the other side and the people who were trying to defend orthodoxy 
in, you know, the early 19th century, they began to shift to this model where, no, 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 everything was at Sinai. They played down the role of medrash, of hermeneutical tools to extract and develop halacha. And I think there is a sense now that if you allow for that fluidity, it creates a shaky ground for people's commitment. I know personally, as do you, that your rabbeim, Rav Aaron Lichtenstein, Rev Rosenzweig, have expressed very real hesitations in this area. I'm curious if you understand why they are hesitant and what you have done to avoid the potential pitfalls of what they are concerned about. I think that's a great question. Perhaps one slight correction or emendation is that I'm not sure if you know, Rev Rosenzweig or Wolkenstein or even the people like the Malbim, the Ksava Kabbalah, they were trying to root all of Halakha in the biblical text, were so arguing that everything was there at Sinai. Well, I think the Malbim is, is explicitly against that. What the Malbim does say, though, what the Ksafa Kabbalah d- does say, is that everything is there if you read it correctly. It's a scientific process. That the Malbim, in his introduction to his commentary in Sefer Biyakura, he gives you 613 grammatical rules that are not mentioned by Chazal, but he argues that Chazal used them. And if you read the text carefully with these rules, you will get to every single Medrash Shalach. So it's not that everything was there in present form at Sinai, but all of the development was pre-programmed, was pre-planned, and it was one correct way to do it. I don't think our Vlachan Sina or Versus Flag would go as far as the Malbin, but with the model that they use to think about development in Halakha based on the writings of Rav Salvechik are developments in science. I mean, there are certain axioms, certain postulates, there's certain facts you just can't get around. Gravity exists. Electricity exists. So where are the Hidushim in science? You're playing around. I'm not a scientist. I never read Thomas Kuhn's uh, Paradigm Shifts in Science or whatever, whatever, <laughs> whatever, whatever, whatever it's called. I'm really out of my field. But the way of salvation describes it in, in the realm of science, and he takes it into the realm of Laka, is that within the system, within the logic of the system, when you're bounded by certain postulates, by certain facts, there's a lot of room for innovation. So Einstein innovated greatly, but it was based on certain limitations. It wasn't a free fall. It's not English literature. It's not the arts. It's scientific development with in a scientific discipline. So that's the model of development in halakha that they prefer. And Rav Salvechik uses this model all throughout his writings. I think Lawrence Kaplan, Chaim Seyman, they both written amazing articles, just like tracing this idea of halakha as science and development in halakha, seeing similar to development in science in the thought of Rav Salvechik. For Rav Salvechik, what that does, on the one hand, it allows for amazing innovations. Einstein was an amazing machadish, an amazing innovator. But on the other hand, it sort of circumscribes where the innovations can be because you're always working within the rules of the system. Where Rav Kunk gets a little bit dangerous, is that he has a little bit of fluidity about some of the foundations of the system. Obviously, he doesn't think it's fluidity about the foundations of the system. But once you're saying the focus of Judaism changes a little bit from the first temple period to the second temple period, and now it's supposed to shift back. And for Rav Kook, there's an added layer of a sense of morality. Everything's always getting better for Rav Kook. Generations are supposed to be getting more and more moral. So Halakha itself, Rav Kook writes, has to keep up, so to speak, with the ascending levels of morality. And therefore, where things can get a little bit dangerous, Rav Kook himself um, is very conservative as a post in terms of halacha itself, but you one might say a certain halacha is immoral. So what do I do with it? So if you are a Rav Salvechik person, you say, you think it's immoral, but science to science, gravity exists, you have to deal with it. If you're Rav Kook, if you're a student of Rav Kook, a father of the school of thought, you have the possibility at least to say, maybe a Sanhedrin would get rid of this. Maybe we'll find some drasha. Maybe there's some fluidity about the system where a new Sanhedrin is going to use the new moral principle that God gave them, because Rav Kook trusts in human moral intuition and assumes that's ascending over generations, and when Mashiach comes, they will just get rid of this halakha. That creates a very different attitude to these halakhas. That's where the danger comes in. And Rav Kook himself writes about this explicitly in a book called Mora the Nebuchadnezzar Hador. It's a book which he didn't publish himself. He references in his letters that he has a full manuscript he wants to publish. He never published it. It was published maybe 15 years ago from the archives of Rav Kook that are still there. There are two versions, the censored version and the uncensored version. But in both the censored version and the uncensored version, there's a chapter about this. Rav Kook writes that his example there is, is Karbanos, is an animal sacrifice. Rav Kook really thought based on Midrashan, based on advancements in the world, that in the ultimate, ultimate, ultimate layer of reality, there's not going to be animal sacrifice. So what do we do with all the psukim, with all the rambams, all the halakos of animal sacrifice? He says the Sanhedrin will find a drasha. They'll say, there it's so no. And sacrifices have to be based on your ratzon and your volition. Once the world develops to a point where people don't want to sacrifice animals, they want to connect to God in a different way, that one pasuk, that one drasha will abolish an entire area of halakha. So Rav Kuk himself writes this. He says, we don't have the ability to do it now because we don't have a Sanhedrin. We can't fully trust our moral intuitions. 
but he predicts that such a change will take place. You can understand how that could undermine the whole fabric of Halacha. And Rav Cook is basically suggesting that we can use the interpretations of Drusha to create more alignment between our inner moral sense and Halacha itself. Whereas Rabbi Salavechik says morality is much more tethered and kind of emerges from the Halachic system itself. Exactly. When you're, when you're for Rav Cook, we're going to guess this is another element of Rav Cook's law that we didn't get into, which might have been a good introduction to this section. So Rav Cook felt that, A, you no, know, God gave us pure souls, we should trust our moral intuitions to a degree, and our moral intuitions are continuously ascending from generation to generation. That is a beautiful theory, if it's true. But on the other hand, it seems to fly in the face of Halakha, which is entirely based on precedent. So we're following the Halakha from people that lived 2,000 years ago, who might have had all these sort of assumptions about the world that we don't share nowadays. How do these two things square? So Rav Cook said that's exactly the system of drushos. That's why the Rambam says God gave the Chachamim, the sages, the ability to look into the Torah and find new interpretations that are fitting for that generation. Rav Cook writes explicitly one of the factors that the Sanhedrin, the sages, use to figure out how to read the Psukim is their own moral intuition. And that is Rav Kook's Kedesh. It doesn't appear in the Ramam, doesn't appear in the Rishonim. And where does he write this again? So he writes this in two places. He has a letter, I think it's in Egeret Tzadi, Petas or Tzadi, in Egrotiria on his letters. There he says that Hashem will be mayor in a Sanhedrin. Hashem will enlighten the eyes of Sanhedrin to find the drasha that is Ra'ui the Fiador, that is fitting for that generation and is ascending levels of morality. In this book, Mora the Nebuchadnezzar Hador, which he, he left as a manuscript, there he says explicitly that it is a factor that the sages use when they are determining a drasha which is also a theory you will find in, in the academic world. Moshe Halbertal has a book about this, that Chazal might have used their moral intuition when determining how to read, how to understand the Pesachim when they're creating new laws. So that is something which Rav Salvechik, if I understand correctly, would not be comfortable with. It's something Rav Lukasin or Rosenzweig, if I understand correctly, I don't want to put words in their mouth, especially Rav Rosenzweig is alive, we just ask him, they would be comfortable with either because you're allowing subjectivity, internal moral sense of the Chachamim, of a particular generation, to influence how they read the subject. But think about what that would mean in the, in the realm of science. Oh, I'm going to get there. I will think about what it would mean for nowadays and so many of the issues that we deal with in Judaism. Before we get to that, and, and I am curious how you kind of personally reconcile these two worlds. I'm curious, have you ever spoken about these ideas with Rav Rosenzweig or Rav Lichtenstein? I mean, there was a notable incident where they took great offense at some of these ideas, really felt that there was no place for them. You were a very close Talmud of both of them, yet you also seemingly ascribe or appreciate the very least that Rav Cook for sure said these ideas. And I don't know, in some ways it sounds like you ascribe or believe in this notion as well in your own life. Maybe you could weigh on that after Afterwards, I'm curious if you ever discussed this explicitly with either Rav Aaron Lichtenstein or Rav Rosenzweig. One more correction. I can't say I was a close Talmud of Rav Lichtenstein. I was very shy, bashful, and I... You were quite shy. I was quite shy. Uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I did not make use of the time in Gush to develop a close personal relationship with him. Okay. So I cannot say I was a close Talmud of Lichtenstein. Rav Rosenzweig, I did spend a lot more time with. We had half a conversation once about this, maybe, maybe a full conversation. Again, I don't feel comfortable speaking on his behalf, but I do think that the model of Halakha is science and development in halakha as development in science versus everything is internal to the system versus the model of the Rav Kook has where human moral intuition is constantly ascending is part of the process that does create two very different models of how halakha develops. I've always had a great admiration for your religious sensibility and your moral intuition. I think anybody who has met you, it is recognizable. I'm sure even me saying that, which is a part of your own moral intuition, absolutely hates hearing it and hates even talking about yourself in any such way. But it's hard not to think about this in 2022 when there are so many moral issues that are unfolding. Issues related to women, issues related to the LGBT community, where it feels like the internal sensibility of our community can sometimes be at odds with the mandates of halacha. And I'm curious for you whether or not, A, you even feel that tension. Is it easier to just retreat to the world of science and Rabbi Salavechik? And if you do feel that tension, and something tells me that you do, 
How do you not get like pulled? What keeps you anchored in the world that you inhabit? This is a great question. I definitely feel attention in several realms. I'm not sure if it's important to go into which particular realms I feel attention in, but the tension definitely is felt. That is one of the reasons I was attracted to Rakuk or this particular aspect of Rakuk. I'll explain it as follows. Several different points. Number one is important to note that Rakuk himself was extremely conservative in the sense that despite these grand theories, as opposed to say, he was chief rabbi of Israel, he left volumes of responsa, he was more or less a mach say. Academics try to go through his writings and maybe you could see certain ideas of Rakuk in his chuvos, but more or less his chuvos read like classical chuvos. And Rakuk is explicit in every place where he mentions this idea. He says, we don't have the ability to practically implement it nowadays because the only divine intuition we can trust enough to change halacha, and the only authority we have to change halacha is a Sanhedrin, the high court, living in the land of Israel with the Jewish people there, which creates, if you know, go back to the times of Tanakh, that is what brings down the Shechina onto the Jewish people. And at that point, we will have enough divine intuition and we will have enough authority through the Sanhedrin to make practical changes. And it could be my intuition is correct in a certain area and the Sanhedrin will make that change. It could be my intuition is totally incorrect, and the Sanhedrin will not make that change. But we don't have the ability to make those practical changes nowadays. So that's why on a practical level, I keep all the halakos, despite certain halakos that I feel like maybe they will be changed when the last level when Mashiach comes, and maybe 15 generations after Mashiach comes, the Sanhedrin will sit around and create a new drasha to change something. Let me give you something that's very, very simple. A non-moral topic. This is non-creation. When are you allowed to say Kriyat Shema in the morning? Until the third hour after sunrise. Why? Because that's the time when the Bnei Malachim, when the princes used to wake up. Well, during one time period, the, the Bnei Malachim, the, 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 the most aristocratic, most luxury-oriented people, wake up in the third hour after sunrise. Talking about 2,000 years ago, in the time period of the Tanayim. I think we both know people that regularly wake up more than three hours after sunrise. It would be a very simple shift to go, you're not even shifting the halakha. Halakha is recite Kriyat Shema until the time period when the last demographic of the population are waking up. And nowadays, it's, it's much later. Oh, yeah. I think it's pretty clear. Maybe, maybe yes, maybe not. Maybe it's an Hedger and we'll change that. That is a non-moral issue that should be tweaked. L'chora. Again, the Chazanesh is a theory that all of halakha is based on the mitzvahs, on the reality of what happened during the time period of the Tanayim. But Rav Chana Wasserman and Rav they both have pieces. They say, no, maybe Chazan will change something. We'll change things like this. Rav Cook goes once that more and says there might be moral issues as well that the Sanhedrin will change. So that's A. The A is that the Sanhedrin has the ability to change things. We don't have the ability to change things today. So on a practical level, not so much is going to change about my life if I believe in Cook's theory or not. However, one place where things do matter is the areas which aren't actually circumscribed by halacha, but might be Jewish communal practice for several hundred years. I think we could all think of examples where Shulchan Aruch is mute on a certain topic, but just Jews have never done this before. It's not something the Jewish community does. There's a negative minhag against it. And there are many rabbinim that are very, very reticent to make changes in that area. So I know of some tamide tamide of Rav Kook now who will say that based on Rav Kook's theory, we're not going to change halakha. We don't have the ability to change halakha. We don't have a Sanhedrin. But at least in these gray areas, the halakha doesn't actually say anything. It's just a Jewish communal practice. Maybe that's where we can apply Rav Kook's theory to make certain changes in the Jewish communal practice. What do you say to that? Are you more comfortable with that? Depending on the situation, I'm definitely more comfortable with that. I think it also gives meaning or gives a context to some of the changes that have already taken place in our community. Let's say women's Talmud Torah. So I think it's very clear if we went back a thousand years, you know, women's Talmud Torah would be frowned upon by all the Rishon. Nowadays, in, in the modern Orthodox community in America, it is something that is celebrated. What changed? If you actually read the letter of the Chafetz Chaim, it's actually you read the Sadoros. It's something negative. And now the street is so much more attractive and Jewish education, they're picking up on the Jewish tradition through osmosis in the home has broken down. And therefore, Nebuch, we have to educate one. If I recall correctly, that's the language of the Chafetz Chaim. Correct, yeah. If you ask people in the Rav Kook world, and this is something in the Chabad world as well, again, Rav Kook himself was a very conservative about women's issues. But people in this general world of Rav Kook who have this idea in mind will tell you that women's education, women's Talmud study, was never something that was formally awesome. It was something that Sibu Chachamim, that the sages said not to do. Nowadays, as we get closer to Mashiach, as we're fixing the sin of Chava, the sin of the Itzadas, and the gender hierarchy is weakening as we approach the Messianic era, which obviously comes with a lot of confusion, but also is accompanied by a lot of good things. So we should celebrate women's Talmud Torah, not as a Bidi Eved, because Nebuch, you know, the trigger is the fact that the street is so attractive, which is celebrated as something that was always Mutter, was never done. A value unto itself. But now is the generation 
permission to do it because we're getting closer to Mashiach. And Rav Lukenstein has articles celebrating women's Talmud Torah. But what's lacking, if I understand correctly, what he doesn't talk about is what shifted from the time period of the Rambam to today. The context, the framework, the way to think about it is not necessarily there. He's proving from, from the Makarus it's okay, it's good, it's celebrated, but the general context is not there. Let me give you, I can give you another example. Let's say slavery. This is not something that's practical. This is totally theoretical. The Torah condones slavery, slavery of non-Jews, slavery of Jews in certain situations. How do we think about that? So Rav Lukenstein in his in the book Mivak Shei Panaka, it was a series of interviews by Rav Chaim Sabato. Rav Chaim Sabato asked Rav Lukenstein directly. He said Rav Kook has a way to think about this. Again, Rav Kook himself has to be very traditional about slavery, but somebody from the Rav Kook world has a way to think about this. In his time period of the Torah, slavery was existed, and therefore the Torah limited it in certain ways and taught the true ideals of Salam Alokim and freedom, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and put us on a trajectory that we should realize those ideals. But the fact that we don't have slaves today should be something that's celebrated as a of the Torah's values, even though there's certain areas in Shulchan Aruch that were just totally ignored. But he would ask the Bokhansin, but you don't buy into that theory. So what do you think about the fact that the Avos had slaves, the Avos had multiple wives, and we don't? And not that we just don't, we don't want to. How do you understand that shift? So I did not fully understand Rav Lukonstein's response. I could send you the page numbers in the book Mubak Shei Faracha. Rav Lukonstein holds a rope on both ends. He says, I am not more moral than Avram Yitzhak and Yaakov who had slaves and had polygamous relationships, or some of them did at least. But on the other hand, I think it is immoral today to have slaves or to be involved in a polygamous relationship. Uh-huh. What shifted? I'm not exactly sure. I'm not saying Rav Lukonstein doesn't have a way to explain it. I'm sure he does. I didn't fully understand the general framework he was creating. But Rav Cook provides this framework. Provides that general framework. So you can look at halakos that seem immoral, and we're not changing Shulchan Arach. There's no obligation to own a slave. There's no obligation to be in a polygamous relationship. At least we have a way of understanding why we have evolved past that, and why it was okay for the Avos, Imahos, and people in the time period of Tanakh to be involved in those types of relationships. Kind of curious, like on a personal level, you know, everybody has different things that kind of push their moral buttons or their own interiority, this individual world that Rav Cook describes, and then we have this communal world, you know, the standards that we try to uphold, and I'm curious for you, I have no doubt, and I don't want to go into details of what your particular moral trigger is, or where you find it difficult in affiliating or ascribing to some of the details of halacha as we have it today. What I want to know from you is where do you go when you have those feelings? Where do you go internally what gives you the strength? You have a very rich theological world that you inhabit. And it's nearly impossible, given what you've been exposed to, given the writings that you understand, that you can just live and just, you know, have blinders on and nothing ever upsets you. I'm sure you live with a measure of tension. I don't know if it's a great deal of tension or a little bit, but I'm sure you live with some. Where do you go to give yourself the capacity and strength to continue remaining committed with all of this theological nuance and fluidity and depth, but still remain anchored? That's also a great question. Off the top of my head, without reflecting on the question too, much, I would say two things. Number one is that for me personally, there are very few and small number of halachos that I find mystifying in the sense that they seem to be against one of my own internal moral principles. The system as a whole is beautiful. It's amazing. It's a wondrous system and it works. I think Rabbi Jonathan Sachs in the previous generation in English did the most amazing job of describing halakha from a bird's eye view, the Jewish living, which is halakha, halakha living from a bird's eye view and describing the beauty and the majesty and the value system that's there embedded in living the system and how you, if you live a halakhic life, you're living out those values. And it took me to reading Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. And now, now that I'm in Israel, I started reading Rabbi Lazar Mulamed, the author of Mini Halakha, who also has his bird's eye view of halakha. And after you're reading their works, and thank God I've had the privilege of studying Jewish texts for a long time, and I have a lot more to study, but my own findings, they were giving language to my own field in the sense that the system as a whole is beautiful, it works, it's living out values, it connects you to God. It's an amazing, unbelievable system. It's kept the Jewish people alive for so many, so many generations, not just alive, but thriving. And after you read their works and you reflect on it and you think about your own lived experience or my own lived experience, like, why wouldn't I want to be part of the system? Yes, there's 1% here, 2% there. Again, it might be different for other people that I don't find that meaningful. But the system as a whole is unbelievably meaningful. 
That's one, in terms of the understanding of the system. And number two is an essay actually written by Wilkenstein, the source of faith is faith itself, um, where it describes the importance of just religious experience, that if you feel connected to God through living an Orthodox Jewish life, so that itself should be enough fuel to propel you to continue to do that. Because this is the way I encounter God. This is the way I encounter transcendence. This is the way I interact with the spiritual world. And it gives me that. It allows me to connect to God. It, the system on an intellectual level, I think, is majestic. It's beautiful. The values are amazing. And there are here and there, there are certain levels, which I do find mystifying. But I think they're counterbalanced by those two other factors, the intellectual factor, the beautiful factor, and also the financial factor. Joseph, I cannot thank you enough for your time and wisdom today. I mean, you've just been a friend and a thinker to me, you know, where we back channel and talk about all things in life. I always look forward to our conversations. I always wrap up our interviews with more rapid fire questions. My first question, and I first want you to go through in an organized fashion, if you were to recommend recommend a book on this topic, specifically on Rav Cook. Let's start with primary sources and then the secondary sources. Somebody wants to understand Rev Cook's approach to the development of the oral law. Where do they turn? Where do they go? Perhaps the most pointed essay is the introduction to Rev Cook's commentary on Agatha entitled Ein Aya. So Rav Cook wrote a long introduction to his commentary on the Agatha, and that's where he lays out this theory, not about Judaism as a whole, but about the development of halakha, how halakha was learned and studied and practiced during Bayez Rishon, and how it was learned and practiced during the Second Temple period. There are English translations available online. And just let's go over, you mentioned a few others. What were the other essays that you mentioned earlier? So the other essays were the Mahalakha Idiot Yisrael, that's in the book Orut. There's an essay, Chacham Adif Minavi, that's also in the book Orot, and an essay, Derech HaTichia, which is the first essay in the book Ma'amare HaRia, compiled essays of Rav Kook. Those three, together with Rav Kook's introduction to Inaya, I think are Rav Kook's four longer historiographical essays going through Jewish history, with the end of prophecy being the major fulcrum point, and situating himself as the beginning of the third period. Is there any secondary literature on Rav Kook that has stood out for you that specifically discusses these ideas? I think one a great introduction is the it's a translation of some of these essays and amazing footnotes and introductions. A book by Rabbi Mitzal Naor, who is the ultimate master on Rav Kook in general, and particularly in English, is a book entitled When God Becomes History. And he takes some of Rav Kook's historical essays, translates them, annotates them, gives you historical context, and also gives you very, very beautiful and erudite introductions to give context and cross-references to what Rav Kook is saying. I am curious, I don't usually ask this, but I'm going to say, do you have a favorite essay or or work of Rav Cook, or like a passage that always sticks with you? I'll say two, if that's okay. The essay that speaks to me the most is a, I mean, not the most, but the essay that I enjoy teaching the most, I would say, is the essay Tzima On the Kelchai. It's also in the book or wrote, Thirst for the Living God. It is the first essay in the Zer Onim section. And there, Rav Cook describes basically how to try to develop a relationship with God while living in this physical reality. The language is poetic, the ideas are profound. He goes through some standard Jewish philosophical ideas without quoting sources, and then goes in a particular direction. The second essay, second one, which is related to this, is a passage in the end of Rav Kodesh, where Rav Kook writes that the Jewish people have been great at teaching themselves and teaching the world about obligations, about mitzvot. But the time has come, as we approach the Messianic era, to teach the world how these mitzvot are really the source of all pleasure, the source of Eden, the source of Gan Eden, the source of Ta'anug. And through these mitzvot, you can really bring yourself and a nation and the world as a whole to a beautiful, majestic, meaningful life for the individual, family, and community. So I think that in a nutshell sort of encapsulates some of what Rav Kook was trying to do. I absolutely love that. My next question, I'm always curious. I mean, you already have a PhD, but I wonder if somebody gave you a great deal of money and allowed you to take a sabbatical and go back to school and write another word from scratch, what do you think the subject and title of that dissertation would be? That's a good question. If I could veer the question in a different angle, I think if I had a year off, I would not spend it in school. I spent my entire life in school. But <laughs> I think I, no, literally, I spent my entire life in school. I think I would spend it more getting, familiarizing myself more with Eretz Israel. I love going on Tulem. I love walking around with the Tanakh, going to ancient places. I've studied a lot about these ancient places through academic title study. The ancient shuls, I've read about that. Them, but as many of them, I haven't, I haven't actually been there. 
And I think it's so powerful to be in the places that I've been reading about for years. You no, know, to, to go to Qumran, I've just read so much about the Sea Scrolls, to actually go to Qumran where, where they lived and practiced. And just think, you know, 2,000 years ago, Jews in the land of Israel were trying to read Tanakh and figure out how the world God wanted them to live. And here I am 2,000 years later in the land of Israel, reading Tanakh, trying to figure out what in the world God wants me to do. I think that's a very, very powerful feeling. That is absolutely beautiful. My final question, what time do you go to sleep at night and what time do you wake up in the morning? I usually go to sleep, I would say, between 11 and 12. And I usually wake up around 5. A last question. This is a technical one. I don't ask everybody. Is your PhD available online if people want to read it? It's not available online. You could be in touch with me if you want it. God willing, I hope to be able to publish a revised version of it as a book. So stay tuned on that. We will absolutely stay tuned for all of your thoughts and writings. Rabbi Dr. Yosef Bronstein, thank you so much for your time, your wisdom, and most of all, your friendship. Thank you so much. Rabbi David, thank you so much. It was an exhilarating conversation. After my conversation with Yosef, he sent me a voice note, an addendum, like so many people do, because he felt he left something out, and we'll include those now. Shalom Aleichem, David. I hope everything is well. So I'm sure if I listened to the interview again, there would be a million and three things that I would want to change, so I'm not going to listen to it. However, almost immediately after we ended our call, there was one thing that jumped out at me. The answer I gave, I definitely think is insufficient, and I would like to add to it right now. Towards the end of the interview, you asked me that if I have some moral questions questions about different halachos. So what keeps me committed? And do I have any advice for other people? So what I feel like I failed to emphasize was that this was a personal answer based on my own limited and subjective experiences. Meaning I am somebody for whom the system more or less has worked for. I was blessed with amazing parents, amazing opportunities to learn Torah, amazing teachers along the way, amazing opportunities. And I was able to really grow and learn and develop an appreciation for the system as an insider. And whatever no questions I have about the system are really negligible when I think about things on a total scale. However, perhaps just to state the obvious, number one, I am male. Number two, I am heterosexual and I'm able to be part of an amazing, amazing family right now. And in addition to my upbringing and my experiences, my educational experiences and the opportunities that I had, it could be that all of that uses together to create this ratio that on the totality, I could see the beauty and the grandeur intellectually of the values of halacha. And number two, the system could lead towards those positive experiences. However, I totally understand how if somebody with a different identity or different background might have a different ratio between the parts of the system that they feel very connected to intellectually and experientially and the parts of the system that they feel mystified by. And for such a person, the conversation would really have to be very, very different. It has always intrigued me that at the heart of the oral law, there are two personalities who have a disproportionate contribution to the very development of Torah Shabbat Peh. And those are Kohanim, like Rav Tzadok and Rav Kook, and Gerim, meaning converts, like Yisro, who the very giving of the Torah is in the Parsha of Yisro, like Unkelis, who translated the Torah, and of course, the person who stands at the center of all of Torah Shvalpeh, and that is Rebbe Akiva. And it's these two like archetype personalities in their approach to Torah, Kohanim and Gerim, converts and Kohanim, that I believe model these two paradigmatic tug of wars that are taking place throughout Jewish history, where Kohanim, in a sense, represent the people who are protecting and preserving the Misora. They are the ones who are ensuring that the underlying ideas remain intact generation after generation. Yet there is another component in our Mesorah, which is all about creativity and interpretation and stretching the ideas. And that is represented, I believe, in the work of Gerim and their contribution and interpretations of Torah. All you have to see are there are two schools of thought in Jirash, two central ways in which we derive laws from the Torah, and that is the school of Rabbi Yishmael and Rabbi Akiva, whose scholars have already pointed out that the school of Rabbi Yishmael is much more tethered to the plain meaning of the text, while Rabbi Akiva is much more constructive and interpretive and likes to expand the ideas. And Rabbi Yishmael, of course, was a Kohen who lived. Kohanim are all about insularity and the integrity of that chain that stretches back to the days of the temple, that protective preservationist mindset. While there is a second school, which are Gerim, converts, people who come and literally go through self-transformation in their very sense of self, who begin as Gentiles and then come under the wings of the Shechina, Tachas Kanfei Ashchina, come towards Yiddishkeit and reinvent their very sense of self, dare I say the ultimate act of creativity. 
And I think these two archetypes are always in dialogue with one another. I actually have an essay on this in my medium-selling Hebrew Safer that I never quote and wasn't (laughs) far from a bestseller, but you could find it for free online on hebrewbooks.org. In the last essay in my Hebrew work, Barogaz Rachem Tizkor, I have an essay called Nisbach, which is actually a pun if you read it online. It means an appendix, but has a double meaning in this context. And it's called Kohanim V'gerim B'Mesorus Yisroel, the role of converts and Kohanim in the development of the tradition of the Jewish people. And what the essay is all about is this tug of war that I believe is throughout history, not between literal Gerim and literal Kohanim, but between the ideas that they represent, one representing preservationist, people who are trying to protect and preserve the integrity of the Mesora, and the other are the Mechadshe HaMesora, the people who are creatively reinterpreting and adding new ideas. And these exist throughout Jewish tradition. The Meshamre HaMesora, the people who are protecting our Mesora, and the Mechadshe HaMesora, the people who are creatively reinterpreting our Mesora. And I'll just end with an idea of people, because I know so many people did reach out. I think there is a struggle when you see that there was development and evolution in the tradition of the Jewish people. It wasn't given in one, necessarily in one shot. But what I think what we are doing is we are wedding these two two worlds together, whether it's Gerim and Kohanim, whether it's taking the world of Bechira and free choice and uniting it to that world of Yediyah, of divine foreknowledge, uniting the messiness of the world that we live in with all of its creativity, with all of its ambiguity, to that pristine divine plan that we can only access with divine foreknowledge. There is a beautiful, absolutely beautiful Medrash that I believe is taking note of these two types of Torah that emerge from the world of preservationist of Kohanim and the world of creativity of Gerim. And that Medrash appears in Medrash Rabbah in the 19th chapter, and it says, Asidim Gerim lihios Kohanim Misharsim Bebeis HaMikdash. That in the future, it's going to be the Gerim, the creativity that is going to be united and also be serving within the Beis HaMikdash. And I think that that is a futuristic vision where these two worlds that seem to sometimes be at odds with one another, it's not easy to see how the creativity in our Mesorah coheres with the preservationists, how the more traditional camps can cohere and coexist with the more creative camps. But I think it's with the ultimate unfolding in time and in that great future that we will see Asidim Gerim Lihios Kohanim Misharsim Beis Hamikdash, where it's going to be the Gerim that are going to be able to serve directly in the Beis Hamikdash, where these two worlds and these two archetypes are going to be integrated and cohere with one another. Gerim and Kohanim, Yedia and Bechira, deterministic and free will, the world of prophecy and the world of choice. What we're ultimately working towards is to integrate these both and see it was the plan throughout that even our very sense of self, so to speak, is part of that divine prophecy, that divine promise that unfolds throughout our lives and throughout all the generations, ultimately uniting that world of ambiguity and chaos with the divine plan that was there all along. The knowledge, She'ein lanu me'atzmenu klum, rak ma she'ashem yisbarach nosen. The knowledge that our very sense of self, our very capacity, our very story, our very narrative, was God all along. So thank you so much for listening. This episode, like so many of our episodes, was edited by our dearest friend, Daniel Emerson. And before I go even further, I'm going to actually break from our normal outro and remind our listeners, be sure, before you shut off this episode, be sure to check out the articles that we have online, specifically on this series. We have an article by Yosef Lindell, a five-part series on the development of the oral law. Check it out on 1840.org, and you really want to check out an excellent collection by our fearless editor, Yehuda Fogel, that really collects the key primary articles, the thought of Ritzelda Kakoin. If you're still listening, make sure you go online and check those out. It wouldn't be a Jewish podcast without a little bit of Jewish guilt. So if you enjoyed this episode or any episode, please subscribe, rate, review, tell your friends about it. You can also donate at 1840.org slash donate. It really helps us reach new listeners and 
continue putting out great content. You can also leave us a voicemail with feedback questions that we may play in a future episode. And I know those voicemails are coming in and I'm so excited to get to that episode. And that number is 917-720-5629. Once again, that's 917-720-5629. If you'd like to learn more about this topic or some of the other great ones we've covered in the past, be sure to check out 1840.org. That's the number 18 followed by the word 40, F-O-R-T-Y.org, where you can also find videos, articles, and recommended Be sure to subscribe to our weekly emails. Be there or be square. Thank you so much for listening and stay curious, my friends.